Okay, in terms of the stuff, the deadlines remaining uh, exam three, exam four, quiz and assignments part four, deadline April 26, so not this Friday, but next Friday, and at the end of the day, 11th and 9th is not yet. Exam number five, the final cover all the stuff, deadlines Wednesday, final week uh, at 5 p.m. And as I mentioned before, the exams, best four count, for 30%, so in terms of the final, if once you've done all the assignments and quizzes you wish to do, and exams one through four, and look at your overall grade, if it's already an A, you're done, because you can't get more A than A. It's less than an A, uh, you can look at the grade estimator, put in your best three exams, put in the, the overall quiz grade, overall uh, assignment grade, and put a hypothetical 100 in for exam five, and see if that boosts your overall grade or whatever grade or more. If it doesn't, then the final would do nothing. And it's now, so it can't be any like April miracle where it somehow it does what it can't do. So that's the stuff. Before moving on to our new stuff, anything about stuff to be or the stuff that's been that needs more stuff. Okay, so last time we're looking at truth functional logic. And we're looking at how to build truth tables. And we saw that with the rows, the handy thing there is it's a nice, very simple little equation where the number of rows is always two to the n, where n is the number of claim variables, and R gives you a number of rows. So if you have two variables, it's two to the two, now four to three variables, two to the third, eight, etc. Then, the tricky part, as we saw, is building the columns. And we'll see more of column building in the near future. Now, so far, we've only looked at the two-variable table. So what occurs if we have more than two variables? Well. We build like this. So traditionally, if you have three variables, it would be P, Q, and R, just because it's tradition. As I mentioned before, there is no like international committee of variable monitoring. But that's just kind of the tradition. So you could use anything, but traditionally this is the way it's done. And traditionally, you would put them in the order of P, Q, and R. Now, what would happen if you put them in a different order? Well, nothing. As long as you do the, the T's and F's right and they're consistent. It doesn't matter. Just like again with, with traffic laws. Is it the way of nature that one must drive on the right side, hand side of the road? Well, no. We do that here. And in Britain, they drive on the left-hand side of the road. But everyone's going to be doing the same thing or trouble arises. So here's how you build a three-variable table. Now, the basic rules, of course, always remain the same. So you have three variables. So the number of rows is equal to 2 to the n. So eight rows. Then, of course, we're only dealing with three variables, so we just have three columns. And again, we'll, we'll never see this again, because it, aside from showing how three variables work, it does nothing. But it serves an illustration of how this, this operates. So I put P, Q, and R in place. And then the question is, how do we fill in the T's and the F's? Well, the same basic rule applies. You head to your right, and you alternate singles, T, F, T, F, until you run out of rows. So you do this TFTF uh, pairing four times, total big rows. Then you have, next thing you do is set to your left, facing the table, and you alternate pairs. So TTFF, TTFF. And then the final column of the table, it's done correctly, is always going to be half and half. So in this case, it's eight uh, rows, so four Ts, four Fs. And then so any three-variable table done correctly using P, Q, and R, the star will always look like this. Never be different. So that's how you, you build it. Now if you had a four-variable table, it would get you know, even bigger, but the same rule would apply. TF's all the way down, pairs, groups of four, then you know, half and half, and so on for ever bigger tables. Before moving away from this to more table, anything about building the three variables that needs any more stuff. <coughs> now I mentioned back in the beginning of the section that our truth functional language has only the following parts. We have claim variables, we have the connectives, and parentheses. So one thing we have to 
cover is, how are presidents used, what do they do? Well, they work just like they do in mathematics and English. The idea being is they contain stuff. Although, you know, when you're writing out you know, normal English, you usually use to put in stuff where you're like, well, it should be in the sentence, but I can't quite fit it in normally, so you have parentheses. But in math, they're critical because they show us in what order to do operations. So to use a simple example, you can have the same you know, numbers and connectives, but where you put the parentheses makes a difference. So if it's you know, 2 plus 2 times 5, that would of course be you know, 12. But if we move the parentheses, go to all the same stuff, this would be, of course, 2 plus 2 you know, being 4 times 5, so that would be 20. Same mathematical symbols, same numbers, but different results. And in logic, the parentheses work the same way. So it matters where they go. So this is different from this. Even though they get all the same parts, except for where the parentheses go, Putting the parentheses changes things. Again, just like the reason why it works the way is just like with math. Where the parentheses go tell you, you know, what you're what you're doing. So how do you know what you're doing? Well, typically what we do is we hopefully make an educated guess. We look at what's being said and we're trying to get it into symbolic form where we then put in the parentheses where it says what we said in the original sentence to illustrate. If we have something like this, if Paula goes to work, then Quincy and Rogers get the day off. Now doing translations, if you want to do the translation grind, which is basically just, you know, doing it step by step by step, the downside of that of course is anytime you're doing something step by step by step by step, that of course it takes time. It can be a little boring. But the advantage of doing something cautiously step by step by step is you're less likely to make a mistake. So when things are important, like surgery or you know, pre-flight checklist, it's probably good to go through it step by step. If, however, you know, it's no big deal, if things go wrong, then not so critical. So how do we step by step this? Well, here's usually how the step by step goes. The first thing is you need to know what you're working with. And we'll take this example. Paul goes to work, then Quincy and Rogers get the day off. Now the first step if we're doing the step-by-step -step grinding thing is to replace the English with the claim variables that we have. And so we would need to know what they stand for. In this case, P stands for Paul goes to work, Q for Quincy gets the day off, R is Roger gets the day off. So first step in the grind is this. We swap out the variables, oh, sorry, the English for the variables, so we get if P, then Q, and R. And so at this point, we've still got some English left, because we swapped out the variables um, in the variables for what they stand for, but we still have this English stuff left. The next step is we get rid of the remaining English and convert it to the logical connectives doing that based on what we saw, you know, what they mean. So you have a if P then Q, so it becomes this, P R on Q, and R, so it would be this. So at this point we've got our parts, P then Q and R. Then what we have to do is the final step. The final step is always putting the parentheses in there. And we have to know where they go. So we have to decide looking at the original sentence, what is being claimed. Now one way to do this, of course, is just like with any skill or ability, eventually you just get good at it and you can do it without really thinking about it. Just You just kind of see the way it goes. But going step by step, we look at it and say, okay, what's being said? Now there's only so many places the parentheses can go without being obviously weird, like you couldn't have you know, that or this. So you can't do those things. But in terms of where it could go, essentially two options. It could go here, around the P and Q, or it could go here, around the Q and R. And those, even though they're the same components, they say two different things. So what's the difference? Well, this way, sort of the first translation, 
would be if Paula goes to work, then Quincy gets the day off. And on this view, Roger, lucky Roger, always gets the day off. But that doesn't seem to be what this is saying. It seems to be saying that what is conditional, the condition for Quincy and Roger both getting the day off is that Paula goes to work. So this original one is you know, Roger gets the day off no matter what, and Quincy only gets it off if Paula goes. But that's not what it's saying. What it's saying is if Paula goes to work, then you get both Quincy and Roger getting the day off. So we would parenthesize it this way. Because this says that if Paula gets the day off, then we get both of these, Q and Paul. And that would be the correct translation. So putting the parentheses does require looking at what's originally being said and interpreting you know, the most plausible meaning. And essentially, this is the way to grind through it. Again, step one, swap out the English for the claim variables. Step two, swap out the English version of the connectives for the symbols of the connectives. And then the final step is parentheses go into place. And in many cases, the parentheses are the trickiest thing because you have to figure out, you know, what is going with, with what. Now this takes us into something we looked at briefly before, the test for validity. Now, one thing that can occur that makes testing for validity more complicated is we looked at the simple example last time of our good friend, Modus uh, Pelicus, or Fermin the Antecedent. And this is a really simple thing, repeating QPQ, we build the table pretty easily. But when parentheses come into play, then what happens? Well, this is where we get into the problem of the columns. Namely, suppose we have an argument like this one. Now, we have a P then Q and R, P there for Q, and the question would be, well, you know, how do we build the table for this? Well, the P and Q part is easy, because that's going to look like it always looks. And then the challenging part is this part. Do, you know, what do we do with the P then Q and R? Now, it will get its own column, because, again, the, the column rules, which are you know, kind of complicated, is that every variable gets its own column, that's easy. Each premise gets its own column, unless it's already a variable, unless it's a variable, then it's already got a column. And then what you have to do is, each of the simpler parts, until they get down to the variables, gets its own place. So what you have to do is, anything that's more complicated, you have to break down the parts. And each of the parts gets its own place. Now with the, modus ponens that we saw, the breakdown is pretty easy because we've got if P then Q, B, Q. So we break it down to its parts, P then Q breaks down to P, Q, and of course we already got P, Q, so simple. Only three things go on the table. But when we've got P, then Q, and R, it gets a little more complicated. Now again, the P gets some place, it's a variable. Q gets some place because it's a variable. But what do we do with this? Well, it does get its own column. So it gets its own place. But if we just stuck this up there by itself, just had a P column, a Q column, a P and a Q and R, then we wouldn't be able to do the table properly. I mean, yeah, if you know how this all works, you could work it all over your head. But we don't have all the parts we, we need because you just can't stick it up there by itself. So what do we have to do? Well, we have to break down the complicated sentences. So how does this break down? Well, again, we keep breaking stuff down until all we're left with is claim variables. And all the stuff we end up from the most complicated down to the variables gets their own column, again, with a rule, no repeats. So kind of the guide is, Everything gets its own column, no repeats, and you break everything down to the simplest parts. Again, no repeats. 
So this would break off in the following way. Breaking off the P, P gives its own column, which it already does. And then we'd be left with Q and R. So that gives its own column. And of course we have to break that down. So this breaks down to P, Q, R. So we end up with five columns in total. So the general idea is whenever you've got something you know, complicated, it's got to break down into the simplest parts. And again, there's no uh, standard guide for this, like how many times you'll have to break it in terms of like, you know, it's going to be three or four or whatever. But you, everything has to be broken down into the simplest bits. And again, every bit gets its own column with no, no doubling. That is to break it down to sort of the, metaphorically speaking, the atoms, the variables. So that's the breaking of down. So before moving on, anything about how you break the stuff down that needs any more stuff? And no matter what it looks like, you still break it down essentially with the same principle. So if you had something sort of like really complicated, something like that, even though there's all kinds of stuff going on, you can still break it down just step by step. So the idea is you, you know, keep simplifying it, break off you know each of the pieces, and each time you simplify, you you know pull off a pair of the premises, sort of drilling down more and more, until again you get down just to the claim variables. So that's the breaking it down procedure. So using that as our example, if we have this, the P and Q and R, then we'd end up uh, with this. So we have P gets its own column, Q of course, R, and then Q and R gets its own column, and P then Q and R gets its own column. So every part gets its own place. Now, then in terms of filling the T's and F's, the same thing we do as we always do. And as long as you know the basic rule for table construction and how the variables work, and as long as you go through it step by step and teach it each step right, you always get the whole thing right. So in filling in the T's and F's, we start off furthest to our right, alternating singles. So TF, 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 all the way down. Then we head to the left, alternating doubles, TT, FF, TT, FF. And then we get to the furth furthest to the left, alternating groups of four, so it's half and half, four T's, four F's. Then, with the other columns. Now, in our illustrative example things for the variables, we had P and Q and P then Q. So how do we deal when we got Q and R? How do we deal with P then Q and R? Well, here's how it goes. No matter how complicated a sentence is in true functional logic, the sentence only has one main connective. What does that mean? Well, the main connective is the connective that is outside of all the parentheses. So, metaphorically speaking, when something's in parentheses, you can treat it like a, ball, uh, a bag, a box, a bucket, ship container, whatever metaphor you like. So it's considered to be you know, one thing. It functions as just you know, one entity. Again, going back to the analogy, if you're at Publix and you buy a box of cereal and you get into the 10 out of the less lane and someone says, hey, you're, you're cheating, there's got to be thousands of, you know, hundreds of flakes in that, you know, that box of cereal, you'd right to look at them like they were crazy because one box of cereal is one item, no matter how many flakes are in it. And if you have a bag of oranges, one bag of oranges is one bag of oranges. It's you know, 10 items or less. Then I kind of wonder, like, if you have just loose oranges, do they count individually? Well, anyways, I'm sure they have a whole system of that. So whatever is outside the parentheses is the main connective. So if you, even if you, again, if you had something pretty super complicated, something like this, and this thing looks, you know, you got 
if k then p or r and z then d, even though it looks like there's a whole lot going on, because there is, metaphorically speaking, we can treat the parentheses as just a single thing. So we could call like all these things, treat them as like a. So this is just a conditional, k then a. And so we always have just one connective, and the way to spot that is put together properly, you look at the parentheses, and the connective that's outside the parentheses is the main connective. And now as you start to, to break the thing down, you'd find you know, at each level a different main connective. So kind of the first level, it would be this conditional. Then the next level, looking at this thing, um, P or R and Z the D, we would have just a conjunction here, because this is, we could call this, um, you know, cat and dog, so we have cat and dog. Then when we break this down again, we then end up with K, P or R, Z to D, and so this would be, since there's no parentheses, it would be a disjunction, and this would be a conditional. And then we finally break it down to all the variables, and then we'd be done. We'd have all this stuff that have to go on to our, our table. And so at any given you know, level of you know, breaking down, you'll still only have one main connective. Because all the stuff that's in parentheses, again, you can treat it like a bag or a box, a bucket, or a shipping container, whatever metaphor you like. All of that stuff is in there and it's treated as one thing. So if you have a box of cereal, it's just one box of cereal. Yeah, true, it contains a whole bunch of you know, cereal flakes or nuggets or whatever type of cereal it is, but it's still just one thing. So in this case, with P and then Q or R, it's a conditional. So the way you do the table, you treat Q and R as just its own thing, namely this column. So the way you do it, the table is, you look at Q and R, and again, our, our example one for defining the, the connective involved P and Q, but it says there, says to you, hi there, I'm a conjunction. Look to my left, look to my right. If they are both true, I am true. If they are not, I am a lie. So we look here, we look here. If they're both true, it's true. So true, true is true. True, false is false. False, false true is false. False, false is false. True, true is true. True, false is false. False, true is false. False, false is false. So Q and R would be this. Now, even though it's not P and Q, it functions the same way. It, the whole thing is true only when both parts are true. Then we leap to this, and it's a conditional. As you recall, a good friend the conditional says, hi there, I'm a conditional. Look at my antecedent. Look at my consequent. If my antecedent is true, and my consequent is false, I am false. Otherwise, I am true. So in this case, Q and R is our consequent. So we look from here, this is our antecedent, to here. This is our consequent. And again, when you're dealing with parentheses, you can think of them as making their own thing. So yeah, it's Q and R. We can think of, we can call it like, this is Bob. This is Bob's call. So it's if P, then Bob. Or whatever sort of metaphor you might, you might care to use. If any. Metaphors are always optional. So if true, then true is true. If true, then false is false. If true, then false is false. If true, then false is false. And of course, with a conditional, if the antecedent is false, the conditional is always true. So we don't even have to look at Q and R because it's going to be, this whole thing is going to be true because false and true is true, false and false is true, false and false is true, false and false is true. So true, false, 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 true, 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 true. And as you can see by that example, as long as you know what the connectives mean and you go through each step and each step is done correctly, the end result always has to be correct because it is true functional logic. If every step is right, then the whole thing is going to be right. Before moving away from this, anything about the main connective that needs any more stuff? Which kind of sounds like an old 70s game show, the main connective. Now another concept, which was um, made use of by 
developers back in the early days of computing, and there's other functions as well, is what's called truth functional equivalence. Now this has a, a couple functions. One is it tells us which things mean the same thing. And there are things that sort of initially we think, yeah, that can't mean the same thing. But if we do the truth table for it, we can see weird. It seems totally different, yet it, is, it means the same thing. And so it's useful for sorting out when things mean the same thing when they, when they don't mean the same thing. Another use is, of course, on standardized tests. They're designed to stand between you and your dreams, an obstacle uh, to keep you from succeeding. And one thing they can sometimes help sort out problems is go from something that is hard to kind of process, you know, when you're thinking about it, but then truth functionally equivalent it to something that is easier to process. And that may not seem like much, but switching over something that's it kind of like, you know, sticks into the wheels of the brain and something about that, that's easier to work with can make a, make a difference. Like on that game section, um, the LSAT, I mean, they're games in the sense that Hunger Games and games, and it's terrible and horrible, but essentially they're logical puzzles. And it can make a difference switching it to something that's easier to work with and something more complicated. And that could buy you, you know, seconds, which can be the difference between getting into that you know, Yale Law School or being forced to go to Harvard <laughs> or wherever one goes. I could not get into Harvard. Shockingly, <laughs> shockingly enough. I didn't even try. So, how do we do the truth functional equivalence? Oh, what's the third thing? Well, I mentioned before, back in the ancient days of the war time, uh, programmers looked for ways to jam as much code as they could into the smallest space. Because if you talk to you know, super old people, or about the, the history of computing, back in the early days, they measured memory not in gigabytes, not in megabytes, but sometimes in like kilobytes or even bytes. And so you had to put in, be really, really, you know, sparse with your code. And one way you can make this happen is by using truth functional equivalents that take up less space, <laughs> weirdly enough. And when you're dealing with like tiny amounts of memory, that makes a difference. You might have heard uh, the ancient history from 20, 19 years ago, the Y2K world. And that arose kind of from this problem. What they would do for dates on computers is they would use two digits which was working great, you know, like in the, the 90s, because 1995 would be just 95. But as you might imagine, when you roll around 2000, the year would become zero, zero. It was actually going to be a real problem. I mean, we got through it, not because it wasn't a problem, but because people fixed the problem. And the reason why they went with that is because it would save, you know, those two little slots. You had to use slightly less memory. But over you know a lot of you know numbers, a lot of years, that would save enough. And so back then people didn't worry about it. Today people just you know like heck I got gigabytes, so just put all that that stuff in there. So true functional equivalent means this definition. Informally, kind of incorrectly, two claims that are true functional equivalent mean the same thing. Like to use an analogy, dozen and or left and port, or right and starboard, essentially meaning the same thing. More formally, and more incorrectly, two claims are truth function equivalent means if you build a truth table for them, for each claim, and you do it correctly, the columns will be identical. That they'll have, I mean obviously it's not from the top, they'll have wherever one is true, the other is true, whatever one is false, the other is false. They're equivalent. And as a practical matter, what that means is, True functionally, you could, you could use either one. They'll do the same thing. So, what would be an example? Well, obviously, since we're using an example, these two are true functionally equivalent, but when you first kind of look at it, if someone said, is P then Q, is that the same thing as not P or Q? Think of a concrete example. If someone says, if today is Thursday, then tomorrow is Friday, Suppose I say today is not Thursday or it's Friday. And most people will probably say, no, those are totally separate sentences. Those don't mean the same thing. 
but weirdly, they do. <laughs> and here's how to prove it. So do the truth table of P then Q, that's our old friend, namely the conditional, which says, hi there, I'm a conditional. If my antecedent is true and my consequent is false, I am false. Otherwise, I'm true. So true, 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 false, true, oh, sorry, true, false, 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 true, true, false, false, true. Then we have a disjunction with a negated, with a negation as one of its, its conjuncts. So in this case, we don't look at P and Q, because it's literally not P. We look here and also here. And since it's a disjunction, it says, hi there, I'm a disjunct. I'm true when either part or both are true. I'm only false when both of my disjuncts are false. And so we gaze upon the not P column, because there, we gaze upon the Q column. And since it's a disjunction, if we see a T anywhere in the row, it's true. So true or false, true, false or false, false. True or true, true, false or true, true. And so weirdly enough, we end up with not P or Q being true functional equivalent to true to P then Q. And again, it seems kind of weird because again, if someone says to you, hey, if the day is Thursday, then tomorrow is Friday, yeah, it makes sense. If someone says, Today is, um, you know, if today is not Thursday or it's Friday, that seems weird, but it means the same thing, weirdly enough. Okay. Or another example, which may would show that you know it does seem to say kind of the same thing, if someone says, if you get a 70 or better on the final, then you get an A in the class. So either you'll not get a 70 on the final or you'll get a A, which says essentially the same thing, you know, not 70 or A. So that's true functional equivalence. Again, informally, kind of correctly, they mean the same thing. Formally, correctly, we build a table so that correctly, the columns aside obviously from the top are identical. So wherever there's a T in one, the T in the other, wherever there's an F in one, there's an F in the other. And in terms of uses, it's useful to see if things mean the same thing. It's useful on standardized tests. And back in the ancient days when every you know, tiny bit mattered, it uh, was a way to you know, compress code. So this would take you know, three slots, and this, this would take four. Not much, when you're dealing with tiny amounts of memory, this would be preferable. And also, uh, people design circuits. They do a lot of things with more complicated things like NAND and NOR. And you can save all kinds of you know, space and make things you know, better in various ways. So if you take a class in circuit design, you'll see all that stuff. Before pressing on, anything about this stuff that needs more stuff? <coughs> now, conditionals, for most people, are a nightmare of logic. And so, it would, of course, be useful to have some handy guides to defeating the evil of the conditional. Now, as you might imagine, since people are terrible at conditionals and negations, the LSAT, the game section, is packed full of conditionals and negations. Because people are terrible at that. And again, the whole point of standardized tests is to keep people from achieving their dreams. Well, certain people from achieving their dreams. Like people who can't afford to shuck out the money for the prep tests. So how do we deal with the dreaded conditionals? Well, fortunately, there are some useful tricks for doing so. Now what we're trying to do is go from the normal or semi-normal English to find something truth functionally equivalent. We're trying to find its hidden structure. To use a terrifying metaphor, we're trying to find the bone structure of the thing. So we're doing kind of like logical necromancy. So with a conditional, that involves like the if, but also the only if, and the if and only if. And as we saw before with the only and only, they create all these woes and troubles. So how do we de-woe and de-trouble the woes and troubles? Well, here's how. If by itself, 
easy to deal with. If being used properly, again, you always got to consider people are just going off the rails. But if people are using it, you know, properly, like people in you know, normal usage, if always gives us the antecedent of a conditional. For example, oh, and, and one thing that can throw people off is it's not the order in the sentence where something appears that makes it the antecedent or the consequent. It's where the if is, or the only if, or the if and only if. So in this case, we have Sam will buy the popcorn if Sally buys the tickets. Now, Sam buying the popcorn comes first, but if we said, if Sam buys the popcorn and Sally buys the tickets, we'd get things in the wrong order, because we need to look for that if. So the if, even though the Sally part is second, the if tells us it's pointing to the antecedent. So this becomes, if Sally buys the tickets, then Sam will buy the popcorn. So symbolically, if we have P, comma, if Q, this becomes Q, then P. So the easy trick there is basically, if gives us the antecedent. So we can remember that by like, if a. Don't have to, of course. No, no testing on memory devices. Now, only if initially seems trickier, but it's actually the least tricky of it all, perhaps. Only if gives us the consequent of the conditional. And on standardized tests, like the LSAT, they use only if quite a bit. Because, again, people are terrible at conditionals. And their hope is, the first running question, is that people will see only if and only if as if, and then screw it up and you know not go to law, not be able to go to law school. But here is the trick: it always gives the consequent. So, for example, Sam will buy the popcorn only if Sally buys the tickets. This becomes: if Sam buys the popcorn, then Sally buys the tickets. So P only if Q becomes if P then Q. Now the reason why this one is kind of the easiest to defeat is because you just can kind of remember only if becomes then. So P only if Q is P then Q. So problem solved. But wait, of course, there is more. Before going to more, anything about if or only if, it needs more stuff. Okay, so the way to diffuse them is if always gives you the antecedent of the conditional and only if gives you the consequent. And what I do mentally for only if is I just swap it out with then. If and only if. As you might imagine, it combines both. If and only if. Hence the if and only if. For example, Sam will go if and only if Sally goes. Now this becomes slightly complicated. So you get the if part, and you get the only if part. And the if gives you the antecedent, the only if gives you the consequent. So Sam will go, if and only if Sally goes, becomes this. If Sam goes, then Sally will go. And if Sally goes, then Sam will go. Symbolically, it becomes this. If P then Q, and Q then P. Now, some logic books, if you take logic class, or experience logic in the future, they um, take the uh, step of simplifying this. Instead of having like all that stuff there, they replace all that mess with a, another symbol. It's a double arrow. Notice the material by condition, and it stands for P if and only. In this case, you know if and only if. So you do this instead of all that, and the reason is just a very practical one. That's way quicker to write out, takes less space, less ink, less chalk, expo marker to do. And it's in philosophy, this is super common, so it makes sense to do this. So if you ever see this like double arrow thing, that's that's what it means. This book doesn't use it, but other most other logic books do include it. So if you see it, if you take logic, you'll know what the material by conditional is doing. So those are the if, only if, and if and only if tricks. Now again, people do, of course, um, use those terms you know, in normal life. 
And if they're using it correctly, that's what they mean. So they're using it correctly. And of course, on standardized tests, people are terrible conditionals, so expect conditionals. Now we turn to a staple of all logic and critical thinking classes forever. It's in every one of them. And I guess it's just got to be included. And these are the dreaded and feared necessary and sufficient conditions. And they fall under conditionals. So what are they? What do you do with them? Well, we'll look at the necessary condition, the sufficient condition, and of course, the necessary and sufficient condition. Now, in some cases, these are used to talk about causation, something being a necessary cause, something being a sufficient cause, something being a necessary and sufficient cause, and other times they're just used purely in the context of logic, how they work logically. And we'll look at them primarily in the context of just how they work logically. Now, informally, a necessary condition is an enabler. It's a requirement. If you have that enabler or meet that requirement, you can get what it enables or you can then do what it's a requirement for. But of course, just like with any requirement, just because you fulfill the requirement doesn't mean that you've then done what it's a requirement for. It means you can, but doesn't mean that you've already done so. So to say more formally, a is necessary for B, it can be translated in two ways, which mean the same thing. One is, if A is the case, then B can be the case. For example, we often speak of uh, requirements in this way. So suppose in order to take uh, chemistry two, it's necessary to take chemistry one. So that would say, if you have taken chemistry one, then you can take chemistry two. But of course, the fact that you've taken chemistry one doesn't mean you have taken chemistry two. It just means you can. It can also be translated as, in a negative way, if A is not the case, then B cannot be the case. So going back to chemical example, if you haven't taken chemistry one, then you can't take chemistry two. If, you know, if the requirement is real. You might say, well, I could do get some sort of substitution or do something, you know, hack on a rabbit. Well, true, but in the normal, if it truly is necessary, you, if you don't know the, the requirement, you can't have its requirement for. Now, in terms of um, a practical thing, like what do we do with this? Well, here's the answer. The necessary condition is always the consequent of a conditional. So it's always in the second slot. So if P is necessary for Q, then P would be the consequent. So as a practical matter for doing translations, if you hear, you know, uh, P is necessary for Q, that becomes the consequent, so if Q, then P. And that's the easy way to deal with it. Now, as I mentioned, people also talk about this in terms of causal conditions, one thing causing another. Now, we often think of causes in terms of, like, Something does something and makes something else happen. But there are also causes that are necessary causes, which they don't make the thing happen, but they enable it to happen. And they're still a cause, but not in the way we tend to think of it. Again, we tend to think of causes as like, well, like poison. You drink the poison, you know, you get sick, you die. But a necessary cause is still just as much a cause. And so it's something that you can't have the effect without that cause. It doesn't make it happen, it enables it to happen. For example, um, oxygen is a necessary cause for human life. Why? Well, if there's human life that's lasting, <laughs> then there's got to be oxygen. And if you don't have any oxygen at all, you have no human life. Now, you could have oxygen 